There's an important key to this series we've been going through. Uh, If you've joined us for the first time or one of the few times, we've been going through different verses uh, and passages that have been misapplied or misquoted or misunderstood and, um, and trying to get a better understanding as to what exactly they're, they're saying or what they're meaning. And, and my prayer through this series is that maybe some of the questions you've had in your time in church and in your time in Bible study might be answered. Because when we've heard some of these verses before, if we take time to think about it, we might be wondering about like what this is actually supposed to mean and maybe a little bit confused. So my prayer is not only that, but also that we could pass along certain Bible study tools for you to use in your own study uh, to be able to hear, you know, if someone quotes a verse at you, like last month when we looked at do not judge, we get quoted that a lot. And and so it was good to be able to look at that verse in context and try and understand what exactly it was meaning for us. And and that's actually a sermon you want to keep in mind as we get into this week's sermon. But um, I, I want us to in fact, I almost named the whole series Context, but I thought that was too boring of a title, so it ended up with Burst or Bubble. But context is like a key thing that I was praying would be passed along to all of you, that when you're studying your Bible, you take things in context. But context is a word that I probably could have just named this whole sermon on. And so I want you to take that word context and kind of keep it in the back of your mind. And, and we'll get back to that in a little while as to why. But that word context is going to play a key understanding in not only trying to grasp what this verse means, but also in what it uh, applies, how it applies to each of us. We need to keep that context in mind. And and you'll see it's more than just the biblical context. Uh, But this verse, this last verse, Matthew 18, 20, is, is probably the least egregious of all the verses that we've looked at. This is probably the least harmful out of all the ones that we've studied and it's because the way that I've heard it quoted is not wrong it's just not exactly the point if that makes sense like if you've been in a prayer service or even in smaller church services or a small group or something like that my guess is this verse has been quoted at one point or another for you where someone will stand up and they'll say Matthew 18 20 you know Jesus promises us that where two or more are gathered he is there with them and normally we say that because we, oh, well, that's comforting, right? When you're in the conduct, especially if you're in a, a smaller group of people and you're like, you know, we want to feel like this is worth something, then that's comforting to know. You know, Jesus said he's here with us, even if there's only two or three of us. Uh, but just hearing that verse, it should raise some questions. Like one of the most daunting questions I had from when I was a kid was, what about when I'm alone? Right? So I wonder like, okay, so when I'm alone, does that mean that God's not there? Like, if I want to have good prayer, God presence type of time, do I need to go be with two or three other people? Or I kind of wondered that. Or is it like a percentage thing that like when you pray alone, you get like, you know, 50, 60 percent God. But if you are with two or three other, then it's 100 percent full on presence of God. And and I kind of struggled with that. And then you look at the life of Jesus and I mean, what a terrible example, right? How often do Jesus go off and pray alone? I mean, over and over again. And if I if the presence of God is only in the context of two or three people, then that's not a great precedent to set. And even when he taught about prayer, what did he say in the Sermon on the Mount? Go away from other people into your room and shut the door so that only you and God can hear. Well, that's a terrible teaching if the presence of God is only with two or three people or more. Right. And so once again, it's not like wrong to quote the verse in that way, because obviously God's presence is there when there's two or three gathered in his name. But he's also very much in our presence when we're alone. In fact, my guess is some of the most powerful times of prayers maybe you've had of prayer is in those alone contexts where maybe you can be completely honest about what's going on in your heart and in your life. And you can sense the presence of God there. So once again, this verse, the way that it's quoted is not necessarily wrong. But in order for us to really grasp what Jesus is saying here, we got to start all the way back at the beginning of Matthew 18, where Peter asks a seemingly simple question. And actually, if you were here last year, one of the first family Sundays we ever had, we looked at this verse, this passage at the beginning of Matthew 18, where Peter just asked Jesus, hey, 
who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, normally when that question would be asked, like even today, we would maybe say, well, it's whoever has the most gifting, right? You know, people like Billy Graham who were able to command the attention of thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people all at once. And, you know, thousands of people are coming forward and being saved. You know, that's a great person in the kingdom of God. Or, or we could say it's whoever gives the most. I don't know. Whoever has the most money, whoever dresses the nicest, whoever seems to have their life together the best. I don't know. There's a lot of different answers we'd probably come up with. Maybe if I asked you who's the greatest in your mind in the kingdom of heaven, you might have someone in your thought process as to who that person might look like. But Jesus kind of goes contrary to what anyone would have expected, and he pulls a child in front of everyone, and he says, this is your example. You want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Be like this child. He even says to change and be like this child. And, and so when we looked at that last year, we looked at different connotations of that, right? What does it mean to be like a child? Are, are we supposed to be uh, you know, goofy and crazy and things like that? And the answer is yes, absolutely, we should be. Uh, but even more so, uh, right, it's about that humility, that humbleness uh, of being before God and understanding we need him. Children understand the need they have for their parents. And in the same way, we should have that same mentality. We can't ever get to the point in our life. And, and even to an extent, Billy Graham was a great example of this, of someone who did not think that he didn't need God. Right. That's one of the reasons he was so effective is because he had that humbling presence, even though he was probably one of the greatest evangelists this country has ever or will ever see. And so Jesus says that this is your example. You want to be great in the kingdom of God. Be like this little child. And then he goes on from there and he gives a warning against causing one of these little ones to stumble. And he says it would be better if you had a millstone tied around your neck and you're thrown into the sea, which is one of the first graphic illustrations Jesus uses in Matthew 18 to describe when things are not very good. And, and we can understand this, right? We cannot, at least sane people, comprehend evil done against a child. I, I just saw this last week on Facebook that they're trying to move this sexual predator out to 29 who has no affiliation with our area whatsoever. It's just the judge wants to dump him out here. And, uh, yeah, so people are upset with that, as you can imagine, not just because this violent guy is not in prison for some reason that we cannot understand, because it's not like he did it once. It was multiple offenses against children, uh, but even more so, like, why out here? A and we can't understand that. We can't wrap our heads around what he has done to these children, because even you and I, as imperfect people, can comprehend the rehemperedness I shouldn't have gone. Reprehensiveness. That's it. I found it. The badness of, of, of evil things done against children, right? We can't even comprehend that. So imagine a perfect God having to deal with that. So Jesus has some rather harsh things to say if you're going to cause a child to stumble. But I think even more than that, this is also in relation to, to humble Christians, Right. They're very easy targets, which is one of the reasons why we are so against humility sometimes, because it opens us up. Right. You are vulnerable when you admit that you have need, when, when you are in need of Jesus, when you're in need of forgiveness, whatever it might be, that causes us to be open. And we don't like being open. And so it, it, it does open us up to the possibility of things happening to us. And so Jesus says it'd be better if you just go throw yourself a, into a lake and drown than to cause one of these people to stumble. But then he moves on from just the little ones. And if you have your Bibles there in Matthew 18, if you go to verse 7, he's going to pronounce a woe, which is not only like a form of judgment, but also a warning for us, things to be looking out. And he broadens it out from just these little children. And in verse 7, he says, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If you're in a position where you are causing someone to stumble in their faith, you're causing someone to stumble in their life, or in some context like that, it's a very poor place to be. I mean, that's just dangerous. 
for all of us. And so Jesus gives a warning. It's not good to be in a situation where you are causing the downfall of another person. But then Jesus bronze it up again, right? Sometimes Jesus will do that. He takes the context of little children. He bronze it out to, you know, if you're causing anyone to stumble. But he steps back even more, and he says, even yourself. In the following verses, he says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away, because it's better that you enter eternity with one hand than to enter hell with both hands, uh, it, it, which seems like kind of an extreme thing, right? I said Jesus got a little graphic a couple times in this passage. That would be number two, and number three is he said, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away. And I remember when I was in high school, I, hold, I heard a preacher once who said, no, Jesus means this literally. Like, some of you need to go home and cut off your hand. I mean, he didn't say that, but especially since cutting was such a big thing when I was in high school. That's not something you would say, right? So, but that, he literally, like, took this very literally. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't mean it literally. Because one thing we may not understand is that your hand, your eye, it, it's all connected to this thing that is kind of a rarity these days. But we all, all do happen to have them called a brain. And I know that we think brains aren't all that common now, but we have them, and that's what your hand and your eye happen to be connected to. And so it's not so much about that, right? Jesus is point, and he's being hyperbolic here, right? He's trying to make a grand statement to get us to see that if there's anything in your life that is causing you to stumble, get rid of it. And this might come as some of, uh, somewhat of a shock to you, but did you know you don't actually need a cell phone? to get by in this life? I know it's shocking. I, I've told my youth kids before, I didn't have a smartphone until I was well into college, and they didn't know what there was outside of a smartphone. So that was, that was good. That was a humbling moment for me, too. Um, but yeah, I, like we, we think there's so many things that we absolutely need, laptops, TVs, entertainment, things like that, that if they're causing you to stumble, Jesus says it's better that you cut it off, get it out of your life, than to enter into hell with all that stuff. Right? We have to be able to focus. What are the things that are dragging me down? And really, that's kind of an honest question that you have to reflect on yourself and, and think through. Well, what is it that is causing me to stumble, and how can I get rid of it? Uh, and so Jesus says that, you know, broadening it out, don't cause anyone to stumble, not even yourself. And then from here, he comes all the way back, if you're there in Matthew 18, to the little children again. And in verse 10, he says, See to it that none of you despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in, heavens, in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now this little phrase that Jesus gives here is, probably more emphatic than than we think it is when we think despise when jesus says don't despise the little ones we might be thinking jesus is telling us don't hate children or don't hate the humble believers right don't be angry towards them don't dislike them or whatever it might be and that's not actually what despise means the the word here means to disregard to ignore to not think about that that it's more than just not hating something it's actually being involved in their life, being incorporated together. I, I mean, how many of you have been in a church situation where you felt despised in that sense? Where, like, no one was coming up and talking to you, no one was involving you in any possible way? Uh, I've known plenty of people who felt like that. They, they left the church because it's like no one ever wanted to talk to me. No one ever came to me. No one seemed to care about me. And Jesus says, don't do that. It's not so much don't just not hate them, but don't just disregard them. Don't ignore them. And, and we could have heeded this. I wish I had known this verse a long time ago when uh, a, a lot of churches struggle with this, where we get to the point where we, we focus so much on people who have been here forever. We focus so much on the people we want to appease so that way they keep giving us their money and we happen to ignore these little ones without meaning to probably. And it's not like we treated them poorly. It's just we despise them. And in the same context, there's just no one in the kingdom who we should be despising. Old, young, new, old, whatever. It doesn't matter. There's no one who should be despised in the church. And Jesus gives a warning against that. And his reasoning is kind of unique, that there are angels in heaven are, are seeing the face of God who is in heaven. And a lot of people use this as a text to prove guardian angels. They say this is just showing that they have guardian angels. And 
Uh, I don't know. It, to me, when you think of a guardian angel, you think of an angel that's like with you, following you around, protecting you from whatever's going on. But that's not what this verse says. They're, they're talking about angels that are in the presence of God. And, and I don't quite even understand what Jesus is saying here, just to be honest. I don't know everything. Even after studying it, no one agreed on anything. But what I think Jesus' point was the reason we don't want to despise these little ones is because they have a unique relationship with the Father. Right? They're easy to disregard now because maybe they don't contribute a whole lot of money or they don't contribute a whole lot of gifts or whatnot, so it's easy to write them off. And Jesus is saying, like, no, they have a connection with God the Father. And, and it kind of goes back to, if you remember the parable we looked at briefly at the end of last week, Right. However, you treat the least of these of mine is how you treat Jesus. So if you go and you clothe, you feed, you you care about the least of these. It's like you're doing that to Jesus. That's a good warning to keep in mind. And that's what Jesus is saying. And from here, Jesus goes on to tell a parable. And this parable is pretty familiar. Um, in fact, when I read it, you've probably heard it before. It's very common. I've seen it on Facebook all the time or at least, you know, little snippets of it of leaving the 99 to go find the one. But he starts off this parable there in Matthew 18, verse 12. And he says this, what do you think? That's another way of a teacher. That's how he would start a lesson is, hey, think about this. Dwell on this. Contemplate this. What do you think of this? Verse 12. If a man owns a 100 sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that didn't wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Now, this parable is one that I, I was mentioning earlier. We, we understand to an extent, and I think we understand it in a very good way, but there's more to this parable that's a personal call on our lives and I think we oftentimes want to uh, accept. And so the, we're going to actually sing a song in the second half of the service that is controversial, to say the least. If you've been in the church or on Facebook, you've probably seen conversations, I'll put it that way, about this song pop up all the time. It's called Reckless Love. And a lot of people have some very serious concerns about reckless love, and it's amazing how divided the church can become over something as simple as a worship song. Because you had people over here that were like, if you sing about God's reckless love, then you're a heretic and you belong to a church that preaches heresy. And then you have the people on the other side who are like, if you don't sing reckless love, you are a hypocritical, hypocritical, judgmental type of person who shouldn't belong in the church. And it's like, it's remarkable how we can draw the lines of salvation on a, the, on a song. But anyway, I will just say, if you're ever in our church or any church and a song pops up that you just don't feel comfortable singing, guess what? You don't have to sing it. You could just sit there. You could even tune it out. I mean, like, quietly, don't plug your ears and be like, no, 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 like, don't do that. But you could just not sing it. All of you have that right. No one has to sing when you're here. But the reason why we sing it is partly because of this parable here, which was kind of the proof text. In fact, when we sing it, you'll see this language pop up in the song. Because from our perspective, you think of a shepherd leaving the 99 to go find the one. And to us, that's kind of a reckless move. Reckless is not the same thing as careless, by the way. It's, they're not the exact same thing, right? Reckless just means doing something without regard for what happens to you. Right? It's not thinking about dwelling upon the consequences of your actions, uh, on what it earns you, what it gives you. So you think of this shepherd that leaves the 99 to go find the one. He's risking life and limb and the other 99 to go find the one. It's that type of passionate love that kind of envelops it. And I know the arguments are that you know no shepherd would leave their 99 without having another shepherd there to watch the flock so he's not risking them or make sure that they're in a nice open field where they can't possibly be hurt but here's a little secret about sheep they can find ways to get hurt anywhere they, they, they don't need help with that right they don't have to find a cliff they can in fact break their legs just about anywhere that that's one of the reasons that i think we're compared to sheep is because we both have a propensity for being able to hurt ourselves. 
I mean, it's just what happens. Spiritually, we, we can find ways to drag ourselves down without a whole lot of temptation needed, right? And, and so even if there is another shepherd there or whatnot, which Jesus, by the way, does not mention. He says he leaves them in the field. But even still, there's other verses that describe this incredible, reckless love of God. Like Hebrews 12, 2 talks about how for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. That word scorn is the exact same word as up here in verse 10. When Jesus says don't despise these little ones, it's the exact same word as in Hebrews 12 too, scorning its shame. It means disregarding, not thinking about. It's just used positively in Hebrews 12 too. In other words, Jesus, for the joy set before him, the salvation he would bring the world, fulfilling God's will, however you want to interpret it, Jesus endured the cross, not thinking about the shame, not thinking about the pain that it would rain down upon him only on fulfilling God's will of saving the world. That's a way of speaking of reckless, right? Not giving regard to the consequences of what it would personally rain down upon him because of his great love for us. And so it's, it's no wonder why this parable is so well known. Because we think of that picture of God's love for us, and we're just amazed. Because the truth is that as seemingly bad as it might sound to compare ourselves to sheep, I can look at my own life and say, yeah, sheep might be actually kind of a nice way to describe my life. I mean, the ways that I have wandered away from God, the ways, the times over and over again where I think I know what's best, the the times where I feel that anger creeping up and I just give in or the other temptations creep up and I just give in and and I realize all along God the Father is watching me and says it's still worth it for me to leave the 99 and go find you. Now we can understand the parable from that perspective, but there's one other perspective that I think we overlook, and we get it from context. Jesus just talked about not causing anyone to stumble, right? Not even yourself, not these little ones. Don't disregard people. And then he tells a parable about this shepherd that leaves the 99 to go find the one. And then right after this, Jesus gives a teaching on discipline in the church. Or in other words, when someone sins against you, what you should do about it. If another church member, another Christian sins against you, Jesus is going to tell us what to do about this. And one of the things he says here that we're going to read in just a minute is he says to go. Which means they have wandered off, right? Go to them. See, this picture of the shepherd leaving the 99 to find the one is not just a picture of God seeking us out, but it's a picture of how we, the church, should seek one another out when we should fail. The type of unconditional love God has for you is the same unconditional type of love that you should have for other people in this church. When people sin against you, we can't just write them off. We can't just say, well, they hurt me and that's their own choice, so tough luck for them. That picture of leaving the 99 to find the one is a risky move that we are called to take. And here's what Jesus says. If you're there in Matthew 18, pick it up in verse 15. We're actually going to make our way down to the verse that started this whole discussion. But verse 15, it says, if your brother or sister sins, go, there it is, and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two or two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. When I first started studying this passage, I knew it was going to be a struggle Because upon first examination, right, the way that we just read it there, we might think that Jesus was getting a little discombobulated, right, kind of breaking up thoughts, like he's talking about how to help someone who sins against us, and then he's talking about prayer, binding, loosing. I don't know. It feels disconnected. And and so I'm telling you, it is all very much connected, and I'll explain why as we go through here. And he starts off by addressing a situation that just 
it comes up, and that is when someone sins against you because we're imperfect. I know no one expects it, but inevitably, we church members just screw up sometimes. And someone one day will do something that will offend you, will hurt you, will harm you, or just blanketly is a sin against you. And so Jesus says, if that happens, if a brother or sister sins against you, first off, go to them. Now, in my experience in church, born and raised in church and now in ministry here for nine years, my experience has taught me we don't do this. Normally, and I've just noticed this, when people have a problem with me, when someone has a problem with me, oftentimes they would go to someone else first, talk about it with them, and, and then maybe that person would come to me. And so I'm like, I'm hearing it down the grapevine. That's one of the reasons that, like, the little prayer request cards, I'm not kidding. I've gotten criticisms on there before, and not just about me, but other people. And, and I'll tell you, if you ever write down a criticism on a prayer request card, it is going in the trash without consideration whatsoever. I don't care. If you have something that is actually worth my time, come and talk to me about it. A a anyway, I, that's a whole other thing. But still, the point is, Jesus has given us a prescription. When someone sins against you, go to them first. And I think maybe part of this is that uh, without meaning to, oftentimes when you go to someone else, it becomes gossip. Uh, now, granted, I think most of the people who maybe had a problem with me and went to someone else first, I don't think they intended to gossip, and I don't even know if it ever turned into gossip. But the opportunity fully presents itself. And we have to be careful about this, because gossip will absolutely destroy the unity of Christ's church. And so he says, go to that person. Now, we have to remember something, and since I haven't bothered to take it home, uh, I can pull it out right now. Remember last month when we talked about judging? Right? So if you're going to go talk to someone about a sin they committed against you, remember that lesson. Remember Jesus' words on judging. Check to see if you have one of these in your eyes. If you want to go before someone who has wronged you, check yourself first. And maybe even ask yourself, you know, in this situation, maybe they sinned first, but did you sin back? Maybe I can start off the conversation that way. You know, hey, I've reacted really terribly there, and I'm really sorry, or whatever. But the thing is, when you confront the person, the way that Jesus words it here is notoriously difficult to translate, which is why in almost every Bible it's translated differently. But the point being, go and point it out to them. Help them to see what happened. Because we know full well there's been plenty of times where we have wronged someone without realizing it. And if they just pointed it out to us so we could ask for forgiveness, it would have resolved itself. And so Jesus says, start there, going to them in humility, in love, in kindness, right? Go to them, and in order to win them back. That's why Jesus uses that phrasing. You're not going at them to pronounce judgment upon them. It's, I want your life to be good. I, I want to help you. I want to benefit you. A and then Jesus says, if they don't listen, because there's a good chance they won't, or at least a chance they won't, then go find two, one or two other people to bring with you. Now, once again, this does not say elders or the pastor. Sometimes it could be, but he uses a word here for witness. In other words, if someone sinned against you and you know someone else saw it, go to them and say, hey, I need your help. You, you saw what happened there. Can you just come with me? Let's pray about this. Let's talk about this. Let's make sure we have the right mindset here. We want to help win them back over. All right, can you come with me and help me talk to this person and see if they'll come around then? Right? So once again, in humility, in love, in Jesus, go to them. And then if that doesn't work, then Jesus says in kind of a rather general term, bring it before the church. Now, I always pictured that if it got to this point that it was like, here, like trick them into coming in front of the church. Like you're going to give them an award and, and then be like, by the way, this person, right? And you just kind of lay it out there. Jesus doesn't say specifically how to bring it in front of the church. And I think it's because there's different ways we can do this. I don't think it necessarily means that if this person is so unrepentant that we bring them literally before everyone on a Sunday morning and we just lay it all out there. It might, but another way you could do this is if they're in a small group, go in front of the small group and talk to them about it, right? Or, or a smaller group, or maybe if you know there's core Christians, church leaders, whatever, bring it before them and give them an opportunity. Just make sure, once again, logs out of the eye. 
This is done in love and encouragement and humility. But Jesus leaves open the possibility, even then, they may not listen. And if they get to that point where they won't listen to you, they won't listen to other loving brothers and sisters, they won't listen to the church, then Jesus says, treat them as a tax collector or a pagan, which, by the way, we oftentimes, people will use this as a, a means for saying that shunning is okay in the church, right? If they're unrepentant, then I don't have to give them the time of day. But just ask yourself, how did Jesus treat tax collectors in the New Testament? Lovingly. I mean, remarkably lovingly. He did not cut them out of his life. That's what they did. But I think what Jesus is encouraging here is continue your love towards them without allowing them to fellowship in the formal sense. Now, that seems harsh, right? No one likes the idea of excommunication. It's a big fancy word for it. No one likes the idea of kicking anyone out of church because, right, church is for everyone. But here's the thing. If you have an unrepentant person who, like, for instance, if they got, if they had an outburst of anger and they see no problem with that whatsoever, what are the chances other people in the community and town are going to see that same outburst of anger and know they come to this church and this church has no problem with it whatsoever? What type of testimony does that give to people who don't know Jesus? Oh, they're just a bunch of angry folks, Right? It's not only about trying to lead them back to Jesus, but also to help protect his church from that type of attitude. We're supposed to be a light of the world. We can't be a light of the world if we're allowing things like that to go unchecked. Now, all this might lead into a question that I've been asked absolutely when I've had these awkward, and they are awkward conversations before, and that is, what gives you the right Right. That's I mean, it's a fair question. What gives you the right to point out my sin? What gives you the right to come and talk to me about this? Well, the next three verses, 18 through 20, I think, are Jesus's way of answering that. We, we already read them talking about binding things on earth and being bound in heaven and loosing things on earth. and It will be loose in heaven. Now, the NIV doesn't do a great job of translating here, although it keeps a footnote that does. Not sure why they put it in a footnote, but Jesus uses phrasing here that is more accurately translated, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. In other words, it's not that whatever we do here automatically like pops into existence in heaven, but rather when we're following God's will, when we're gathering in his name, we are a reflection of the reality of heaven. Does that make sense? Because these are difficult situations. When you go and you point out someone's sin, it's a difficult situation. But you're presenting to them a reality of heaven. This is the way God wants his people to act. And, and you broke that. We want you to be able to come back. Uh, we want to help you in that process, however it may look. That's all Jesus is saying with the binding and the loosing, right? Is that we as a church should be a, a reflection of heavenly realities, which doesn't always happen, mind you, but that's what Jesus is saying. What gives you the right? Well, we're trying to reflect what's true in God's will and in his presence right now. And then right after that, he gives that, that promise. Again, I tell you, wherever two or more of you agree on anything, it'll be done for you. I think that still falls within this context because two or three witnesses going before them, right? God's presence is there. If you're going before them and you're trying to lay this out, what gives you the right to do this? Well, we're doing this within the name of Jesus. Not because we want to judge you, not because we want to make you feel bad. We just, we're imperfect too. We're trying to get through this together, man. I've had this conversation with myself, right? And, you're, and so it's showing that God's presence is behind what is happening. And that's what leads us to that famous verse, Matthew 18, 20. Wherever two or more are gathered in your name, or in my name, there I am with them. Because the truth is, you're going to have conversations with people about their sin as you're trying to help them, and they're going to make you think you are doing everything but being a Christian. You're being judgmental. You're being a bigot. You're being an awful person. You're being angry. You're being this or that. And Jesus is comforting his people. If you're doing this in my name, I'm with you even if the person you're talking to isn't. That's what it means. 
It's not just in the context of our prayer times and whatnot. Jesus is reaffirming that when we are doing even difficultly, difficultly risky things in his name, his presence is there with us, guiding us, reminding us that we are doing this according to his will. One other reason why I think that this whole discussion kind of points back to our call to also be that shepherd of leaving the 99 to find the one comes in one more question that Peter brings up to Jesus. If you go down to verse 21, you can see Peter asks this question. Perhaps some of you have been wondering, and in essence, he, he asks, how many times are we supposed to do this process, Jesus? Because that sounds exhausting. Right? How many times am I supposed to go to my brother and point out their sin, and then if they don't listen, we go to the two people, and if they don't listen, we go to the church, and, and then we have to treat them like tax collector. How many times am I supposed to do this, Jesus? And, and Jesus then says, i got a story for you. There was a king once who had a servant that, that came before him, and he, he called him because he was well past due on this ridiculously large sum of money he owed the king. I mean, millions upon millions of dollars, just an obscene amount, more money than he could possibly make, even without debt, for his entire life. There was just no paying this back. And so he says, hey, by the way, little servant, I'm going to cast you into prison. And there, you and your family can work off your debt forever. And the servant begs him, falls on his knees. King, please show me mercy. And the king sees him, and he has pity on him. And he says, okay, not only am I not going to send you to prison, and not only am I going to give you more time, but I'm going to just erase your debt like it never happened. You don't owe me anything. Go and live your life. So the servant leaves there, obviously very happy, and, and we don't know quite what was going on in his head, but he comes across another servant who owes him probably a couple thousand dollars. You know, not a small amount, not like five bucks, but uh, at least a sum of money, but not anything near the multi-million dollar deal he was just forgiven. And, and he says to a servant, hey, you owe me some money. I just, you know, got released of a whole bunch so I could use some more. And the servant says, I, I, don't, I can't give it to you. I don't have it on me. And the servant says, oh, that's unfortunate for you. Hope you enjoy prison. And he sends him off, gets this guy arrested, and the servant is taken away. The, king's hear, the king hears about this, and he calls for that first servant to come back in his presence, and he says, you are wicked. And there's not words for this. I forgave you of more debt than anyone in this world can even imagine, and you couldn't do the same for this little servant? Well, guess what? You get to go work off your deal. Just you. Forever. And then at the end of this parable, in the very last verse of Matthew 18, verse 35, Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. There's a lot of controversial things that Christians believe. I think forgiveness might be one of the most. We don't think of it in those terms. We even look at our world and we see, you know, the world understands forgiveness as a good, healthy, natural thing to do, but I don't think we comprehend how far Jesus calls us to forgive. Jesus is not just saying, normally in sermons when we talk about forgiveness, we jokingly say, you know, someone cuts you off in traffic, you got to forgive them. It's okay, it's annoying, I hate driving in California. But, you know, we make it simple like that like little things, but we all know full well there are sins that have been committed against each and every one of us that we don't even want to talk about. Controversy is Jesus saying, yeah, even those. Even those sins that you don't speak of. Even those sins that aren't even appropriate to say in a lot of contexts. I've seen people online get angry about that type of forgiveness. And it's understandable. But remember that word I said to keep in the back of your head, pull out later, go ahead and pull it back out. Context. Context, in order to understand a verse like Matthew 18, 20, is just invaluable. It helps us to see the context with which it falls. But there's also context in life. 
you don't forgive people because they deserve it. In the same way that we aren't forgiven because we deserve it. We can bring forgiveness to other people because of that context. That I know that in this life, God says that in all the things that I've earned, all the ways that I've worked hard, I've earned one thing. Eternal separation from God. But God didn't want that for me. And so he sent his son to come and bear my sins on the cross. And he doesn't leave, you know, we expect him to say something like, live up to that. Do well enough. And that's the only way you're going to be saved, right? As long as you live well enough, as long as you do enough good, then, yeah, you'll be counted worthy of being forgiven. Jesus doesn't say that. Instead, he paints us as sheep. He paints us knowing full well our imperfections, all the things that we've screwed up at. He doesn't pretend like we're perfect. He knows our imperfections, and the beauty is he still loves us. Jesus has called us to forgive because we've been forgiven ourselves. And that's possibly the most important context of our actions. That's the perspective we bring into this life, and that's the type of unconditional love that we can show to this world. We're going to sing a few songs as we finish up this morning, and we, we take time every week where we take the bread and we take the juice, and to be perfectly honest, there's no way that this moment is ever going to fully help us to understand what Jesus gave up for me, for you. Taking that bread is a reminder of something we spend a lifetime trying to comprehend. Taking that juice is a reminder of something we take a lifetime trying to comprehend. That, that Jesus loves us so much that he came here. Sometime this week, go and read Philippians 2 and look at what Jesus gave up because if we're honest, there's no way we can comprehend it. There's no way we can fully understand it. Uh, that, that Jesus left heaven. He was equal with God, but he didn't consider that equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held on to, something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he gave his all up. He emptied himself out like if I were to empty out this bottle of water. And he made himself nothing. He made himself as not only just a man, but a servant of men. And he humbled himself to death. Death on a cross. But there's a victory that he also brings us that Paul goes into after all that. That he was exalted above all other beings and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That's a victory. You didn't earn, but we get to partake of. One day the world will know. But for the time being, we live in the context of of I have been forgiven. Let's praise him now.